Great. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, so we are going to get started. Um, so welcome to the third discussion of our community conversation series for this year, listening to differing perspectives, the power of symbolism. Um, tonight will consist of exploring the mental models of framing, perspectives, and the importance of listening and the impact symbols have on people. I'm Jill Harvey, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division Director for the town, um, and I'll be joined by a little co-facilitating by Alexa Michelle um, of Powerful Pathways, who will be popping in a little bit later on. Um, but first, we're going to go over some of the housekeeping and the ground rules and expectations for the night before I introduce our guests. Um, so right now, we are making sure that the captioning is all set, but typically at the bottom, there should be a CC block that you can click that should provide that. Um, another question that was asked is, will we be able to see other participants? You won't see participants visually, but part of what we'll be doing tonight is trying to make this session a bit more engaging. So as we're going through it and having the discussion, there will be um, some polls that will be launched. And as a part of that, a participation form was included as part of the registration for this. If you filled it out, that's wonderful. If you didn't, you'll still have the opportunity to participate tonight. So what we'll be doing is looking at the options that you should have at the bottom of your Zoom. So in addition to Q&A and chat, which you now see is open, um, we ask that the Q&A be used for specific questions. So if you have questions that you'd like to have addressed during the conversation, we'll be entering them there and fielding them to our panelists. Additionally, there is a raise hand option. So with that, the way that will work is if you are looking to share your perspective or would like to be a part of the conversation, we ask you to raise your hand as we're going through different symbols and images and asking questions. And us on the panel, <laughs> we will be calling on folks to be able to participate. So if your hand is raised, I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, and you will have the option to talk and um, be promoted to a panelist to join us on screen to share your perspective as well. So to answer that question, it's a little tough because you won't necessarily see everyone, but if you would like to volunteer and do want to engage in this conversation, then you will have that opportunity and you will be promoted um, to be a panelist, to join the discussion, and then back to the audience. Um, so bear with us because this is the first time we're doing this. <laughs> so I'm a little bit excited to try and make it a bit more engaging. And I am just seeing now, I think we are having an issue with the captioning option. Um, so I do have someone working on that right now. So again, sorry about that, bear with us. We're trying to get that working, but once it is available, I will let you know and I can direct you to where that button will be. Um, in the meantime, I can also start to go over the ground rules that we have. Um, so let me just pull those up because we do do these normally. And let me... Okay. Okay, so for the ground rules, we all have the responsibility to respect and build on the strength that diversity provides. We will engage in polite, constructive, productive dialogue and feedback. We will respectfully disagree with each other. Um, unless you are a designated representative of an organization, opinions are considered your own. And when sharing a question, please be short and to the point. <laughs> um, and for this session, it's a little different because it's all about perspectives as well. So we do wanna allow time to hear from as many folks as possible. Um, and we do wanna use this moment and space to take some time to allow for self-reflection. Again, as with all of these community conversations, we do touch upon some difficult topics and it is a lot to take in and sometimes you just need to take that time and space to really self reflect and reflect on what others are saying. And as always make sure you're taking deep breaths, because some of the content is heavy so we want to remind folks to breathe I need to remind myself to breathe it's been a struggle today, <laughs> but reminding yourself to take deep breaths is what we're here to do. So i'm going to stop sharing and i'm going to. Let me see. 
um, get out of this. And now that we've gone over the ground rules, I want to introduce our guests. Um, so we have with us Cynthia Deedle. Did I did I say your last name correct? Okay. <laughs> Biggest fear. Um, who joined the civil rights team at Facebook as their director and associate general counsel this past March. And she focuses on civil rights, specifically the intersection of law enforcement, hate crimes, investigations, and outreach. Um, and prior to joining Facebook, Cynthia served as the director of civil rights reform at the Matthew Shepard Foundation for four years and led their national hate crime enforcement training program for law enforcement officers and prosecutors. I'm gonna let Cynthia share a little bit more about herself um, and I'll do that now and then we'll pass it over to Brett. And then I'm gonna share a bit more about one of our other guests who's gonna join us in a little bit. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. I appreciate the introduction and it is uh, quite the pleasure to join everyone this evening. So hello everyone. Um, in addition to what she said, I also spent 22 years as a special agent with the FBI focused exclusively on the civil rights program. And that encompasses hate crimes and police brutality and misconduct, human trafficking as well. Um, I've devoted my adult life to these issues and trying to figure them out. Uh, Brett and I have worked together for a number of years. And as we say, we, uh, we live in this space of hate and we just, we try to figure it out. We try to bring groups together, groups that normally are not um, collaborating and coordinating. Um, and we try to make communities safer. That's really what we both have been focused on, I think, um, while we were in law enforcement and then after we have left to, to try to still uh, move the needle regarding hate crimes and community engagement. So I also spent a good number of time um, in my career working with victims of hate crime and also just crime victims in general. Um, I was the FBI's lead agent um, after 9-11, helping the victims in New York following the terrorist attack. And I also helped the victims in Boston after the marathon bombing. So I spent a lot of time um, working in the space, working with victims and communities and law enforcement, um, civil rights advocacy groups to just try to um, create some understanding, share some stories, and hopefully uh, make some communities safer and more welcoming and inclusive. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. And next, we also have Brett Carson with us, who's um, retired from full-time paid employment with the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C., um, in February of 2020 is when he retired, but he does remain with the agency as a reserve police officer part-time, and he currently works with agencies and organizations whose missions he believes are essential to improving policing and society. With more than 25 years experience in local, state, and federal law enforcement, Brett is an internationally recognized leader who has championed award-winning innovations in multiple areas from programs to improve police service to underserved communities and protect victims of domestic violence to ensuring essential services to the families of officers injured and killed in the line of duty. And with that, it's a little brief, but I'm gonna pass it over to Brett to tell us more about himself. Well, thanks, Joe. It's good to see you again. And thank you for organizing this. Hello to my friend, Cynthia. Um, let me start off by giving all of you greetings. I'm not far away actually right now. I'm actually at the tip of Cape Cod, in Provincetown. So right here in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But I start off by uh, saying the 10 words that none of you have ever wanted to hear. I'm from Washington and I'm here to help you. Um, I literally am from Washington, DC. I uh, was born and raised in the nation's capital and spent, um, as Jill said, 27 years with the Metropolitan Police Department, which is the main police agency in the nation's capital. Um, that is not primarily why I'm here though. Uh, I'm primarily here as Cynthia talked about because of my work, most of my career dealing in underserved marginalized communities, investigating, responding to and helping prosecute bias related crimes. And then also consulting around the world, members of uh, law enforcement agencies to try and deal with all the contemporary issues that I have no doubt that you're talking about in Arlington, 
that we're talking about in law enforcement as law enforcement leaders and rank and file members. And I am very much looking forward to this because what, what I have tried to do my entire career, and I know Cynthia shares this passion with me, is go places that police officers tend not to go. Um, those are areas that, that sometimes make us uncomfortable, uh, whether it be surrounding ourselves with a, a crowd of people that may not share the same beliefs or, or ideas that we do, or people that are maybe angry with us and have questions or are critical of our profession, but also putting myself in, in the shoes of other people and trying to look at those perspectives. It's happened to a lot, a lot to me in my career. Um, just to share with you very personally, um, as you look at me right now, you probably make many assumptions about me as a, as a human being and as a police officer. And, you know, within the four corners of the screen, I probably look like an older, bald, white guy to you. Um, well, uh, I, I actually wear a lot of hats. and I'm a member of many different communities that I'm sure at some point will come out during this conversation. But what it has allowed me to do throughout my career personally and also help police officers all over the world, including my agency, is help them sometimes put the shoes on that other people walk in and understand their perspectives. It's hard sometimes. It's really hard as a police officer sometimes to protect a group of people that if they knew who I really was behind that uniform and that badge, they might not like me or might in fact actually be violent towards me. But I know what my role is and I know what I swore an oath to do, which is to protect and serve the Constitution and the, the citizens of the community where I serve. So that's kind of where I wanted to start with the foundation and, and the welcome and say hello and encourage all of you to, most importantly tonight, listen. Um, listen to the perspectives of each other because where I think we are right now in the world as a nation, and it sounds like right there in Arlington, is sometimes we're, we're all very, very, we find it very, very important that our perspective is heard but we oftentimes don't give the opportunity to listen to others and their perspective. doesn't mean we have to agree with them. It doesn't even mean in the end we have to like it. But sometimes it gives us a frame of reference to understand that where we assume someone's coming from, from their perspective, may not actually be where, where they're coming from. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Joe. Great. Thank you for that. And I'm just going to share a little bit about... Um, Another panelist who's going to be joining us a few minutes late, probably closer to 7.30, um, but his name is Zane Crute, and he is the um, current president of the Mystic Valley NAACP branch, and he's also a financial services professional with J.P. Morgan and Chase, and within their corporate and investment bank. Um, he's a graduate of Boston College's Carroll School of Management with a Bachelor of Science in Management and a concentration in Finance and Marketing. But Zane has been with the NAACP and has been the president since January of 2017. Um, the Mystic Valley area branch has also served Northern Boston suburban communities. So Arlington is a part of that um, for the last 40 years in the fight to promote social, economic, educational, um, and political equity for all. So Dan will be joining us shortly, um, but I think from there we're going to get started. And so with that, um, I'm going to just kind of set the context for something Brett had touched upon, but we're going to discuss what framing is before we start to get into the topics around different symbols and images that we're going to discuss. <laughs> and so we'll have Christina pull that uh, slide up. Okay. And so what is framing? <laughs> so frames are the mental structures that shape the way we see the world. Um, and as a result, they shape the goals that we seek, the plans we make, the way we act, the way we respond to things, um, how we think about outcomes. And, and in turn, frames also shape our social policies and all of the institutions that actually carry out our policies. Um, so all of our lived experiences shape the judgments that we make every single day. And our families, our, our families of origin, the identities we carry, the discussions we have like here today, um, also often affect how we start to categorize and make associations of people and places and things and how we then fill in the gaps um, with what we think we know. 
So based off of something that I might have experienced once before, I'm going to make that assumption moving forward that this is how it's always going to be or what to expect. But really the main point of what we're trying to do here today is hear some different perspectives and share some different ideas and views. And so that we can start to fill in those gaps a little bit differently. Um, I don't know if Brett or Cynthia, if you have anything to add to that, of those mental models or that context for us, and we can bring down that slide. <laughs> so Jill, I, I was just wanted to add that one of the things that I will be doing um, is as, as we share perspectives from the group, hopefully, and from my fellow panelists, um, if there's a perspective that I'm aware of, and I know Cynthia is going to do the same thing um, on a particular image, that, that may or may not be our perspective, right? But that we're aware of that perspective or the history behind it, we're gonna go ahead and share that one kind of as a disclaimer to let everyone understand that, that my role here is not to express my personal beliefs, that what I'm gonna be doing in, in my vast experience dealing with images, particularly images of hate and prejudice and bias, um, giving a historical perspective and also kind of trying to give point counterpoint to arguments as to are these images appropriate are they inappropriate and what's the history behind them so i just wanted to add that Jill. great thank you and i think with that as well so i probably will join in <laughs> um, and i know alensa who's working in the background will may join in as well um, and this will also be the opportunity, I think, for folks, if you have questions or if there's different opportunities that you do want to um, participate, you can. So make use of the Q&A box, make use of the raise hand option. Um, and what we're gonna be doing as well is actually doing some polls as we start to move along in this discussion. So I just wanna show you um, if we can pull up the slide with the number scale. <laughs> I'll explain how this will work for all of the topics that we're going to go through. Um, so once that comes up, I'll explain what that'll be like and where you can find the um, options for that. So. So what we'll be doing is going through some different images and symbols and with that, um for each one we'll be launching a poll so you'll see a little box pop up um on the screen and it'll ask a question and it'll have numbers so based off of the image that you're seeing um audience members we would like you to remember these images they'll also be smaller on the side so you don't forget them um but to just reflect on what your reaction is to that image and enter it in the poll so you'll see it pop up once we have it almost fully populated, we'll um, share that out so everyone can see the result. It will be anonymous, so feel free to you know, be honest with the choices that you do make. And we will go through those and interweave those into the discussion as well. So are we ready to hop into the first image? <laughs> All right. Um, so. Everyone should see the first image, which is Pepe Le Pew. He is sentimental. Um, <laughs> so take this one in and kind of let that marinate for a little bit. And I think we'll launch the first poll for this one. And so everyone should see a box. Um, and I do see, okay, folks are seeing it. So. We're filling up. We're almost there. <laughs> okay, we have almost about eighty two percent of folks who are tuning in participating. So I think we'll give it maybe a few more seconds and then I'll end the poll and I'll share with you all what those results were. Um, one of the questions, how many people? I do believe right now we've got 36 folks. So we will 
end this poll. And share. Okay. So can everyone see those results? Got about pretty neutral. Points. Yeah. <laughs> pretty neutral. I believe that's what they call in statistics a bell curve. Which since I flunked statistics four times is about the only statistical information I know. <laughs> well, I think that that um, is kind of clear. I mean, for me, not until the last, I'd say, few years did I become more cognizant of some of the issues that were really presented by Pepe Le Pew. Um, I don't know if, Fred, if you want to kick this one off. Sure. So we chose, chose this particular image to start off with because we thought this would be a nice way to ease us into kind of how images have changed. Um, I, I can't see all of you right now, so I don't know what our age spread is on this call, but I can tell you that I wasn't alive when Pepe Le Pew was first illustrated and came on television as a cartoon. It was 1945, just a, you know, World War II era. Um, and for anyone that is not familiar with Pepe Le Pew, and maybe that's why you went with neutral because you just had no feelings either way, um, the character, Pepe Le Pew, uh, and an entire cartoon centers around he as a male skunk pursuing very aggressively a female. Um, and when I mean pursuing, uh, using today's standards, we're talking stalking, we're talking sexual harassment, and depending on your jurisdiction's uh, definitions, by most definitions, criminal assault, sexual abuse, um, by touching, uh, force kissing, and things of that nature. And so here is, here is a, a cartoon character, right? Something that a child might see even today and think, oh, look at the cute skunk, or they might think it's a cat. And uh, I think that's pretty cute and funny. And even back in, in the 1940s when this first came out, I, I'm, I'm sure that that was what the belief was, that this was purely innocent. And it was sort of a, a fun kind of storyline of his constant efforts to find his true love and, and to convince her to love him back. But when we look back now with the lenses that we now wear understanding how many women not just women, but also men, fall victim to stalking, sexual abuse, harassment, and other unwanted advances, this cartoon has a completely different slant on it now. And it's one that many people think is highly inappropriate to be on any airway or in public in any way today. So it's just one, one kind of image that we talk, talked about when we were preparing for this that we thought kind of be a, a, an easy way to, to ease into this with a cartoon character and maybe at this point Cynthia if there's anything you'd like to add I'll turn it over to you but I'd like to know is if there's anybody out there that has any comment or questions about the Pepe Le Pew cartoon and maybe now understanding the background if, if their perspectives change I think we're happy to see you type something in the chat ask you to raise your hand if maybe you have a different perspective on it. Well, Jill looks at the uh, at the chat, I would add one, I think, very obvious point, which is we see this in TV shows, comic books, movies. Um, I'm reminded of many sitcoms from the 70s and 80s that now looking back are just uh, very inappropriate in how they um, frame and show uh, what at the time was courting or dating. Um, and now it's completely inappropriate. Um, so it's it's a good example, I think, just really broadly about how images change over time, where they, I don't think that Pepe Le Pew was designed to be um, a harasser or a stalker or someone who was going to commit a crime. Um, I'm hoping that it was designed to be innocent and sweet and funny, um, but it's not funny anymore. Yeah, Cynthia, I saw a comment here um that um, as a kid, that it looks like Anne um, 
was commenting as a kid she had a t-shirt with an image as an eight-year-old in the 70s it's good to see somebody else was a little, a little younger than me in the 70s there and had no idea well and you're not alone one of my nieces who was born in the 2000s actually saw a Pepe Le Pew image and wanted it because she loved the color purple and she also thought skunks were adorable and my sister had to say no I, I don't want you wearing that because my sister of course knew the history of being of my age so it's really interesting that that how that perspective has changed and you're right how a child could look at that and it looks like a cute little skunk with a little smile and flowers and everything but not understanding the backstory I also saw the comment there um, about the um in in light of what's going on in the state of new york right with governor cuomo yeah i mean this is this is really topic du jour if you will when it comes to one of our biggest societal issues um we'll get into discussions of race in, in, a little later on here but we're talking about you know inequality with regard to gender right when we're talking about sexual abuse harassment inappropriate touching inappropriate comments man Pepe Le, Pepe Le Pew checked all those boxes and then some by the way he he was a French character uh and somebody mentioned uh, about the pursuing it was actually a cat not a skunk thank you for correcting me and and all of that just goes into just kind of how at the time seemed completely innocent entertaining and then time has changed that could there be people now that look back at nostalgically and think, well, why would you ever cancel the culture, right, of Pepe Le Pew? That's not what they were talking about there. They were talking about fun, cartoons for kids. Um, that's a perspective some people have. Mm -hmm. And I know Rebecca had raised her hand, so I was going to call on her to share her comments. Bring it on, Rebecca. Um, you should be able to talk. <laughs> I think I can talk. Okay, great. <laughs> so yes, I was just recollecting from my childhood that he's pursuing a cat who he thinks is a skunk. And so this sort of cross uh, animal breed was that like code for inappropriate relationships, miscegenation? Um, and then um, growing up in New England where a people of French Canadian heritage have often been made fun of um, with um, their culture, it, the representation of him has this speaking oddly Franglish <laughs> also could be insulting and and yes potentially this is all innocent has somebody commented i just remember the character is cute but that isn't necessarily how everyone observed this cartoon then or even more so now yeah thank thank you so much for that comment and, and i think you really i think you encapsulated why we wanted to use this first because I think here we have something that I think we would all agree that back in the day, I don't attribute any malintent to the the creator, the 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 artist that created this, the people that produced it, but certainly over time, they had to have become aware of those concerns, um, and it's taken a long time. And let's face it, in some environments, we still are struggling to make sure that those types of assumptions and stereotypes and you know things like that don't continue to be reinforced in our society through something as as accessible to very vulnerable people right you know kids this was targeting children for their cartoons um it's really kind of scary to think that that still goes on in some ways mm -hmm. and i see we've got a few other comments in the chat um, Carrie, Carrie's comment about the fact that uh, it basically reinforced stereotypes of male female behavior, right? That the male was going to be the aggressive one pursuing the female and the female would have to fight him off uh, and, and protect her virtue, if you will, right? That it was her responsibility to do that and that he was, he was, well, in this case, 
all French, uh, all American. Here, um, the boy pursuing the girl. Looking back, man, did that reinforce some stereotypes that we definitely don't want to teach our young people today, right? Should we go on to the next image? Yes, and before we do that, I just want to make note that Zane did join us, so we've got our panel full. <laughs> so we can go on to the next image, and same thing, I'll launch the poll before we dive into the conversation, but again, feel free to use the chat. If you have specific questions, put them in the Q&A, and if you are looking to talk um, and share a perspective, just raise your hand and we'll pick on you. Um, so I need to launch the poll. <laughs> Okay. And can everyone see that now? I think someone had a few issues beforehand. I think we're close to everyone voting. And if you don't know the image, that's also okay. I think we will end it here. Let's see. Okay. Can everyone ah, okay. see the results? You know. I think it had gotten cut off before, but I just want to make sure everyone can see. So no one <laughs> gave it a four or a five. <laughs> so so it's clear that this group runs from neutral and then more towards the uh, having some sort of a, a negative or unhappy view of that image, which uh, is, you know, a change from Pepe Le Pew, right? We had more neutral um, there where this is definitely skewed towards that area of discontent or unhappiness with the image. Um, I, I want to welcome Zane since he didn't get a chance to say hello. Do we want him to say hi and see if he wants to, to pipe in on this one or I'm, I'm happy to take the lead on this one as well. Sure, thank you, Brett. Thanks for having me, everyone. I'm glad to be here. So candidly, Jill briefed me just before this panel. I had no idea personally of the, any negative connotation for this meme character. The only instances I see this meme Canada is just like the crying Michael Jordan meme. Whenever like a athlete or someone in sports messes something up, I see it put on like a t-shirt or put on the person's head. So that's the only recognition I've had of it. I'm not, prior to this, I was not personally aware of the negatives. Well, Zane, since you are probably not the only one, let me just share with everybody in case not everyone on the call is, is familiar with, uh, this is Pepe the Frog. Uh, Pepe the Frog was a, car a cartoon character that was created and it was been popular on the internet for quite some time. However, over the last five plus years, um, the image has been um, basically hijacked from a, a cute little car cartoon character, uh, a, a, a GIF, I guess is what you call it on the internet, um, by members of the alt-right, by white supremacist groups um, and groups that see um, people of color, uh, marginalized communities as inferior. And this image is oftentimes used, uh, put over the faces of African Americans or other people of color uh, to make them look different. Um, and the implication is all of the things you see are stereotypes of those, those groups. And you know, here we have again a cartoon character, right? Something that was created initially probably to make people smile. And from what it was originally created for, now is being used in ways to cause harm, uh, to send messages of, of hatred, bias, and prejudice in some ways. Um, and the view of it, I can tell from this group, um, is now decidedly not good, right? It, it is not on the positive side at all. 
Um, and I would imagine that those, those neutral folks, probably many of them just had never heard what it represented. And I'll be very honest with you. The first time as a police officer, I was called to what we call a, a defacing public property, which is when somebody you know, spray paints or puts graffiti on a public space. Um, it was an image of, of Pepe the Frog that was placed over um, the face of Harriet Tubman at an elementary school. And it was just a sticker that was placed over her face. And my initial thought was, oh, that's kind of cute. One of the kids must have put their sticker over top of that. And it wasn't until the African-American vice principal came up to me and said, yeah, officer, I, I don't think you understand what that image actually means and placing it over her face, particularly what, what that means to us. Um, and I very quickly did some research and found out, wow, my perspective on what that was was completely different than other people who were much more aware of, of its history. Can we invite some discussion here? Or any comments or questions here? Yeah, sure. I was just going to say that. Um, if anyone has seen this before or hasn't or has a view, definitely chime in. Um, okay, someone's saying they can't see choices four or five. Can they move up on the screen? Um, yes. Um, So for, um, I see that Miriam made that comment. Miriam, for me, when I move my cursor off of my screen, the toolbar disappears and I can see it just fine. So maybe try that to move your cursor off the screen so that the, uh, the action bar at the bottom disappears for you. Hey, I'm wondering if Janice would be willing to come off mute. Janice. I'd love to ask you a question if you'd be willing to, to engage me in just a second. Yeah. Yeah, invite her to come off mute. Great. Yeah. Can you hear me, Janice? Test yes, it out I there. Can he I can Hi. hear you quite clearly. Can you hear me? Absolutely. And thanks, thanks for your comment. I, I had a question. What was sure. it that made your gut clench? What was it about the image? Knowing nothing about it, what was it that just viscerally you reacted to? Um, I was, when I was typing my comment, I was trying to figure out what it was that hit me. Um, I think, I'm not really sure, but the expression on the face to me is pain. It looks yes. like the, the caricature or the character is in pain. Um, I'm not sure what gives me that idea, but that's what hit me. And um, I felt that it was some, that it was inherently racist. That's the only thing that I can think of. Um, it gave me a very different feeling than the Pepe Le Pew um, cartoon. Gotcha. So your visceral reaction was, it looks a bit menacing, painful. Um, and, and there were characteristics about the face that jumped out at you as, as screaming racism. Yes, I wouldn't say menacing. Gotcha. Okay. I didn't get the feeling of, of menacing. I got the feeling of pain. Gotcha. And racism, racist. Wondering if anybody else picked up on anything specifically from the image that struck them as potentially a nod towards racial inequality, a racist, and, and turn this into a racist image in some way. I can say I saw a comment from Lynette. Um, I'm not sure if she wants to elaborate on that. And thank you for sharing, Janice. While she, while you're, while you're getting her up there, um, Christopher mentioned specifically that the lips, the eyes, which Christopher, I'm going to speak for you. I'm assuming the bulging eyes, um, and almost a bit of a blank stare there. 
and just the general sadness, which, which was also mentioned um, by Janice. Let me see. Let me move from the right speak if she'd like to. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the image looks angry to me and um, gives off um, an energy that feels um, negative and dangerous. And yeah, and, and that caricature, the, the, the lips and the eyes are, you know, a caricature uh, of of um, of African Americans. I mean, and it just looked like such a an insulting, gross, unpleasant image. Um, that I that I then I start thinking about well, who would create such an image? Like, what was this? Why was this created? And uh, and the the anger that it seems to, there seems to be to me it's it's got rage in it. Lynette, uh, before I, I ask Cynthia or Zane if they if they have any comments, I just want to acknowledge something that I don't even know if you realize happened. When you were when you were struggling almost to find some words to to describe your reaction when you talked about the lips and and who they made you think of. It, it's a painful thought to realize that because of society and, and, and many of the images that have been you know, perpetuated over and over again, that we think of these things with, with, that's why it's called implicit bias, right? Like you see an image and implicitly your mind goes to a certain place. It goes to a certain type of person, a certain environment, certain actions. And, and that's why images like this are just so insidious and, and dangerous. Thank you for sharing, Lynette. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the other comments that had come through was centered around the oversized lips being used as a racist stereotype. So that was seen and clear and folks were commenting on that. Um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to share anything before I went on to the next one. I mean, just imagine if your son, daughter, granddaughter, grandson came home and had this sticker on their lunch pail, right? That, that, you know, one of the other kids was passing out stickers with this image. What, you know, and, and your child probably wouldn't know anything other than it looks like a frog, you know? That's a conversation nobody wants to have. Should we go to the next image? Yeah. All right, now we're going someplace. <laughs> See how we eased, we eased you in this one, didn't you? <laughs> didn't we? Okay, so let me launch the poll. Okay, so it's launched. And this question goes directly out to you, Miriam. Can you see all of the options? Because I want to make sure that you, that everyone can see everything. Can we see the scale? It's one through five. One is, ooh, five is, yeah. Okay, you can't see it. Okay, so let's see. Let me see. I'm gonna chat you privately to see how we can fix this. <laughs> we'll give um, folks a couple more seconds to complete the poll. Photo of speaker covers form five. Okay. Let me see if this changes. 
Did moving that help, Miriam? Okay, I tried, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end this poll um, and share these results. Can everyone see those? Look at that. We moved from a fairly neutral image to one that was skewing towards the emotions that are not happy ones to now one that is decidedly that kind of red angry looking emoji there. So I, I'm wondering if anybody um, has family in the South who uh, might have a different perspective and may not wanna share, it's not your perspective, but might want to share the perspective of someone they know and love who sees this image in, in slightly less a negative way. They, they may not view it as a positive, but, but see it as something less than offensive. I can start, Brett. Um, I am uh, coming to you from Knoxville, Tennessee. I live in the South. Um, I've lived here for about eight years now um, with my family. And this is not an uncommon sight. They're on uh, vehicles. They're proudly displayed in uh, flying high in people's yards. Um, the stickers are not rare to find um, just out and about in the state. Um, it seems to me, this is just a personal opinion and a little evidence, but it seems more uh, prevalent in, not in the cities of Tennessee, but more in the rural areas. Um, but it, it, it won't take you long when you drive through Tennessee for sure, and I'm sure other Southern states to, to see Confederate flags display, displayed very proudly and other um, similar paraphernalia and ephemeral that's displayed on properties. Um, the folks that I've spoken to that fly the Confederate flag, um, never ever have I heard someone say anything uh, geared towards the racist connotation of the flag. It's always about their pride in being from the South. It's their pride in their ancestry, um, going back generations, uh, grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents who lived and worked in the South. It's always couched in very much of a um, proud to be a Southerner um, attitude. Um, I've never heard someone just outwardly say I'm racist and that's why I'm flying this flag. Um, but it's, uh, it is disgusting. I am um, a Mexican Latina by ethnicity and also a proud member of the LGBTQ community and even just seeing this on the screen is, is foul and disgusting um, and quite the trigger. Um, so it, a little perspective to start the discussion, but I welcome the thoughts from others. I'll jump in on that, Cynthia. Thank you for sharing your prospectus. Me being, you know, Massachusetts resident now, born and raised in New Jersey. What you say about Tennessee does not just apply to Tennessee. The countryside of New Jersey, the countryside of Massachusetts, the countryside of New Hampshire is the same. We have the same pattern in most of the country. You know, the urban metropolises are one way, the country is the other. And I've always heard the same types of stuff, you know, Southern pride, rah, rah, rah. But in all honesty, that opinion is just bad. It's misinformed, it's ignorant, it's misguided. It's the same thing how some people, whenever an African-American person gets, you know, beat and murdered by the police. It's always, you know, oh, what was, he didn't listen to the police officer. What was the report card in eighth grade science? Did they get a C? Did they ever steal candy from a candy store? Like it's always, you know, it's misdirected. It, it opinions grounded in ignorance. Like this is a symbol of hate that wasn't more prevalent until, you know, the civil rights era. This symbolizes losing a civil war. Like imagine, you know, Nazi Germany, you know, rah, rah, this is our family who was Nazi troops. We wanna, you know, 
we want to honor our fallen soldiers. Like, it's just not a good opinion. Uh, it symbolizes racism, slavery. It symbolizes, you know, to African Americans and other minorities that you are not welcome. We don't like you. We don't want you here. Like, that's what this symbol does and triggers to me personally. It's interesting you said that, Zane, because uh, uh, for those of you that are not old enough to remember, there was a TV show, I believe it started in the late 70s, called Dukes of Hazard. Um, and uh, I see Zane and, and Cynthia smiling. Jill, you're clearly far too young to remember that mm -hmm. show. Uh, <laughs> but this show glorified the whole notion of this being a symbol of pride. And, and it stayed on a major network and was a very popular show throughout the United States to the extent I grew up in Washington, D.C. I was a minority where I grew up. Most of my peers and, and loved ones were African-American. I had friends, African-American boys and girls, who had lunch boxes with the Confederate flag on it because they had Dukes of Hazard lunch boxes. And I think to myself now, looking back, how, how this image, right, they, that it's been, tr they've tried to normalize it. They've tried to make it into some, something that was not its intent to begin with. It was representing a nation that declared themselves that wanted to overthrow what the United States you know, was, was about, which was getting rid of slavery at that point. And, and thank you, Janice, for your, uh, your commentary on uh, whether or not it was good watching for the Dukes of Hazard. there. We'll give it a thumbs down, the Siskel and Ebert thumbs down from Janice there. So is the love boat, Grant says. <laughs> um, I'd really be interested to hear what type of emotion Zane, Zane shared, obviously, I think, the painful feeling, right? Just that, that visceral reaction of what that evokes and thoughts about you and, and your race. Other people on, on this call have any comments or emotions? They definitely feel free to use the chat or raise your hand um, while we wait for folks maybe to decide if they want to talk. I mean, for me, this image is, um, it's frightening. And it's when I do see it, I actually am struck with fear, whether it's driving and it's in someone's yard or on a car, on a bumper sticker in front of me, it's really terrifying because you just have no idea what that person is thinking. Um, whether it's they're full of pride or if they don't want to see you on the street. <laughs> um, yeah. So Jill, I'm going to go there. Uh, I, I, I want to see if I can push the envelope here. You mentioned a bumper sticker on a car. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll take it to some other city in America. We won't put it in Arlington. But uh, you see parked in the police department's parking lot a vehicle parked in police parking only, a private vehicle, and on the bumper is the Confederate flag or Dixieland. Praise Dixieland. The South will rise again. What does that make you feel about who drives that car and where they may work? Makes me feel like I should get out of Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I am not going to be protected by the person who owns that car. If it's an officer, um, you said if it was parked at a police station or someone who was maybe there, maybe just to resident, I don't know, but I certainly would feel like I would head the opposite direction <laughs> and probably I not look back. <laughs> I, I saw Zane nodding his head. Similar feelings, Zane? Absolutely. I've always kind of ran from this image all my life. Like, I've never felt like I was invited to, like, a NASCAR event. Like, I wouldn't feel comfortable <laughs> going. If I seen someone's on someone's house, I wasn't going there. I seen the, the flag at a state fair in Pennsylvania before I wanted to leave. I'm like, yeah, I don't even want to look at anything here. I want to go. Like, take me far away at it from here. Is Isn't this it interesting, though, you mentioned... Uh, I'm sorry, Zane, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just similar to what Jill was saying. It's always been a symbol of I got to go. Like, I'm not welcome. I got to get as far away from here as possible. Yeah, I'm not sure if everybody's aware. Um, NASCAR is actually one of the most popular sports in the United States. And it was only recently, was it two years ago, Cynthia, that they de 
decided that NASCAR would not allow the Confederate flag image to fly at any of their events again. And just they suffered. Year. Was it just last year, Zane? Thank you. Yeah, after George Floyd. Yeah. They suffered tremendous backlash from many in the NASCAR community. It's still alive. This mindset is still alive. Yet, I would imagine if we had uh, Daughters of the Confederacy represented on this call right now, they would likely speak. I want to remind you, I'm representing the, the opinion and, the, and perhaps the thoughts of, of, the, of the other side of this, it, it, so to speak. But I, I would imagine that there are, are, are members of Daughters of the, you know, the Confederacy or people who do Civil War reenactments who feel very strongly that this history needs to be kept alive, that, that the sacrifice of the South um, to fight for their culture and for their heritage is important and to ban this image is is hateful in and of itself it's it's erasing a group of people that existed within the united states um whether or not we agree with that i, I would imagine there are people that would say i am not racist it has nothing to do with slavery i saw that comment here by the way um was it is it melissa there are people who still deny the civil war was about slavery cue the scenes of january 6th yeah well there are there are and and some of them um, um uh, I won't, I won't make any personal commentary on judgments on it. What I'll say is those perspectives exist. I want to just comment on something that Martha put in the chat. Um, so she says as an Asian person, she finds that road rage is very scary. And she assumes that if she sees a flag like this, the, the person who owns that flag or who's displaying that flag um, possibly has a weapon and she feels less safe. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. And especially now, where we see so many states that are open carry, open carry um, laws that have been passed saying, you wanna buy a gun and carry it, you may, without a license, without training. I think Texas um, is passing a statute that's, uh, that says just that. It's, that's very frightening to just not be sure when you're out in public who is armed and who's not. And if they're um, displaying racist behavior or they're making racist comments or anti-ethnic comments, anti-LGBT comments, um, and you are part of that marginalized group or you are an ally of one of those groups, it's, it's hard to know how to respond because you don't know if the person is going to respond violently or not. So I, I, Martha, I'm with you. So, um, by the way, it's interesting also to me, kind of, kind of how this weaves its way into modern day politics, right? That that the South is is viewed largely as as a more conservative stronghold politically, um, leaning towards the Republican uh, Party. Um, yet, back not too long ago, some of us were alive back then. There was actually a section segment of the Democratic Party called the Dixiecrats. They were segregationists within the Democratic Party. And so this, this issue, while, while it certainly now is fairly divided among political lines, has actually kind of flip-flopped over the years in a way that some people were on one side of the issue and now are on the other side of the issue. It's very interesting. What do you think? Robin added a comment as well um, that you feel that way too on the road, especially since um, they have progressive political stickers on their bump for bumper stickers. So it also kind of highlights many people feeling that almost sense of fear. And Alensa Keen. Interesting how history or lack of knowledge of history plays a role in our perceptions. Exactly. Yeah, I would also say culture, your upbringing, you know, who you were exposed to, right? All of that goes into our, our, our opinions on images. Um, I, I, when I introduced myself, I said I would disclose more about myself. Uh, I'm Jewish, you know, and I, I know that down south, particularly um, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, when Jews went down to help our African-American brothers and sisters in the civil rights movement 
anti-Semitism ran rampant through the South. And it was because that many cases, not only that were folks brought up as anti-Semitic, but also because now the Jewish people were aligned with another group of people, people of color, that were, you know, on the receiving end of discrimination and, and not giving them the same rights as others. What do you think? We need to move on to the next image here. Sure. Uh, Robin, Robin mentions the names of the two Jewish young men that were murdered during the voting mm -hmm. rights. Uh, Cynthia could do an entire dissertation on that when she and I teach together. Um, I think, let's see. The question you asked Christopher, we'll save that for a little bit. We'll bring that one up, okay? Okay, oh, let me launch the poll. Actually, you know what? Well, well, go ahead. No, launch the poll. Oh, I'll address. I, I, no, no, go ahead. Launch the poll. Let's let's do that. Oh. <laughs> Janice reacted immediately. She was afraid that was the thing. You see where this is going, don't you? I'm going to I'm gonna end this poll and I'll share these results. Okay. We can focus so I would be really I would be really interested. It looks like almost everyone. Uh, except for three people were, were all the way on, on the scale um, up toward number one there. I'd be interested, um, and, and if you don't feel comfortable, I I'm completely understand that you're right not to speak out, but I'd be interested for the person that said they see it positively or, or as a smiley face, uh, which number five, one, five reflects, correct? Um, what what your perspective on that image is. I think it's important for others to hear other people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. Or even the folks who kind of felt neutral about it, that maybe yep. you feel if you're not Jewish or you don't know anyone who's Jewish, that doesn't change to you or just this is the opportunity to have some of those different conversations and hear those different perspectives that we wouldn't necessarily hear. Jill, Brett and I do um, quite a bit of training for state and local police officers and prosecutors and we've done uh, hate crimes and we've done this hate crime training program for the last several years and we've traveled um, all over the country doing it. In fact, we've been in Massachusetts, I think three or four times training um, hundreds of officers in the Commonwealth. Um, I think the one thing that, one of the many things that we've learned doing this training for the past few years is when I mention uh, or I show this image as part of the training and I ask the police officers, what do they see? A lot of times they tell me if they see this image on a synagogue, they'll say, I see graffiti. I see vandalism. I see a violation of Massachusetts criminal code XYZ. Um, they don't automatically respond with, I see hate. I see something that is extremely powerful and anti-Semitic. Um, they don't, they go right in a different direction in their head. So it, I think the point is very well made that some people see this and it's a very visceral reaction and others don't have that reaction. They just see it differently. Hey, if, if I could just really quickly, Jill, um, before we get into kind of the, the emotions of this, just yeah. give everyone just a little bit of a history lesson here. Remember, I'm Jewish, okay? I, I know what this means in modern day society. But I don't know if many of you understand that this image actually was created back in Indian culture, 500 BCE. And, and its actual meaning back then meant health, luck, luck, success, and prosperity. That's a long, long time ago. And, and obviously that image has been used since then 
to mean a lot of different things other than those of its original um, meaning. But I, I, I just wonder if there are people that look at it historically and say, no, no, that image just sitting there in and of itself doesn't mean hatred. It's just an image. You don't know what the person's intent was by putting that image up. It isn't unless you know what that person's thinking, why they put that image up, where they put that image up. I see the discussion about uh, the flip. Uh, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's actually part of the class uh, Cynthia and I teach sometimes. We actually have officers look at the difference between those images of the Buddhist image and the swastik because they're very easily confused. They do look very similar, but they are turned differently. And that's the way you distinguish it. Sometimes you just have to literally put one up to the next to the other and realize, oh, it's turned the other way. That's not what it is, what I thought it was. Well, Brett, come back. Oh, go sorry, ahead, Brett. Zane. Uh, no, go ahead, please. Uh, my take on this, Brett, is like a lot of images and people too start off really good, have really illustrious, great reputations. But once it turns, it turns. There's people, you know, whether it's a Joe Paterno or Bill Cosby, you could have known them personally. You could be saying, I love them. That's my person. That's my man. I love them. But once they go down for something truly, truly heinous, so you got to go on record. Oh, I love Bill Cosby. That's my guy. He's such a nice person, such a great human being. Oh, what about uh, Joe Paterno? He... He, he, he could do no wrong. Like me personally, that's just my own take. I'm not going to go on record of like copping out defending certain people who've done something such so heinous. It started off great. What we initially known was, you know, a really great illustrious reputation, even a symbol, but I'm not going to think of anything good when I think of certain people images after the fact. Well, well, Zane, I'd be interested to hear your response to this and also the other folks who are listening here. Um, again, I'm playing a bit of a devil's advocate, but um, you know, I really liked the Cosby show. It was creative. It was funny. There were there was great comedy in it. It portrayed a, a, an African American family, upper middle class African American family. I really liked that show. So, does what Bill Cosby did in his personal life mean that we can't look at some of the things he created in the past as as being positive? And then the second part of that is. I really like Jello. Does that mean I can't eat Jello anymore? Because you know he was the spokesman for Jello for years. Uh, my opinion on that, Brett, that's just for me personally. Other people feel very differently to me. I like to separate the art from the artist. You know what I mean? Because it gets to a point that we'd have to keep a long list longer than a CVS receipt, trying to keep track of who and what we got to cancel. Especially for musicians, like there's so many musicians that I like that have done so much stuff that I don't even know what they did. Like every week there's a new artist that I'm told I personally have to cancel. I'm like, I can't there's... just enjoy the song without thinking of this person. Like there's ones that are really extreme, such as R. Kelly. There's ones that are like Chris Brown who might've smacked a woman just two or three weeks ago. And then there's another rapper who's pissed off the LGBTQ plus com uh, community two weeks ago. So every day, every week, it's something else. So in that opinion, I think one can enjoy the Cosby show without saying, hey, Bill Cosby's my guy. He's such a great guy. You could say it's a funny show. This guy is a terrible, terrible human being. That's just my take, though. Others could disagree with that one. Yes, yeah, I can say I'm wondering if anyone who's tuned in would like to join or speak or share their perspective. Um, I, I, I'd like to comment on Grant's um, comment here. Um, Grant asks, does this mean, whoop, somebody just typed and I lost. Hold on, I got to move up in the chat here real quick. I apologize. Grant asked, does that mean something can never be redeemed or pulled back? We have an okay finger symbol explicitly hijacked by a bunch of Fortran. What a great point. So, so Grant, I'm glad you mentioned that symbol because I actually got called out on this um, because when I, it's just the way I was taught, my father used this and so I picked it up as a kid. When I say the number three and I show people the number three, I, I do it in this way. And it was brought to my attention that I probably need to start symbolizing the number three very differently than that. But then I did this and what does this mean to some people? White power. And so it becomes really hard sometimes to choose your language, to choose your, your, the images that you portray because of the upbringing you have when you had no idea that it meant that to other people. 
But Chris, what I would say, or Grant, I'm sorry, what I would say is, it, it doesn't mean you can't be redeemed, but you damn well better work on it. You just don't get, you know, okay, five years have passed, we're all good now. What have you done to amend for that hurt? What have you done? What have you learned from the harm you caused? That to me, those are people that I would consider redeeming, right? I see um, Carrie has her hand up to say something. So I'm going to call on her. Let's see. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I don't type very fast, so I couldn't get everything that I wanted to say on my, my chat um, statement. But there was a church down on Mass Avenue in Cambridge. Uh, I think it's St. John's Church. And over the doorway, it's been there. I mean, the, the, the church has been there for probably 100 years, if not more. And over the doorway, the entrance to the church, um, there were various symbols. And there was this, which I have always called the Nazi symbol and people in the neighborhood, and there was a big uproar about it. And the church came forward and said, you know, that actually belonged to, um, to goodness. It was a symbol of, you know, of goodness and caring and compassion. And, you know, and uh, um, we're, we're, we're with you. And when, and so when I put my, I mean, I had never heard that, and I, I read more about it. But when I when I saw it just now, um, what I what I realized is that I don't like it at all. But then when I switched to my thought about what it really meant, you know, where its origin came from, um, I was um, I, I couldn't. You know, I couldn't throw it away. So um, I'm just trying to make it different, I guess. That's it. Thank you, Gary. Okay. I see the chat is going wild. <laughs> yeah, we got some great discussion, really great discussion. Grant brings up the Christian cross. You know, this is doing, Jill, you know, exactly what we had hoped it would do is it's making people think about how images over time can come to mean different things to different people. And some of those are redeemable. Some of those are not. Some are appropriate to be displayed. Others are not. It's all context to some people. Mm -hmm. Really, really fascinating. And as we get into these last few images here, I think we'll, you'll see where we've been going with this to talk about some images particularly that I think have been causing a tremendous amount of pain and anxiety in our community and a lot of discussion. Should we move on from this one? Yeah, and I want to let folks know too with the chat, um, feel free to use the um, to everyone option so that we can all see and share. Um, some of them are just coming to the panelists. So if you want that, that's great. But if you want to join the conversation that way, also use everyone. And we can go to the next image. Okay, and I will launch this poll. We've got almost everyone. If you haven't responded and you want to, you have a few seconds left. There we go. 
Okay. Let's end this one and share screen. And the survey says? Um, let's see. Looks like we have about 12% of folks feeling a little neutral. 23% um, a decent smile at number four and around 65% at the five. So leaning, leaning positively, um, mm -hmm. decidedly positive. Well, let me give you a little history on this, um, a perspective that some of you may not realize actually exists. So this, this was actually um, designed by a, a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Baker. Uh, it first appeared in 1978. It's, of course, the gay pride flag. I have friends today that look at this flag, and they're really angry about it. Um, because despite what Gilbert Baker's intention was, which was to represent the inclusivity and the diversity of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, it wasn't the LGBTQ plus community back then when Gilbert Baker designed this flag. Um, this actually doesn't represent, for instance, non-binary people. It doesn't represent the transgender community. It doesn't represent many other aspects of the LGBTQI plus, and that plus is really important in the community because that's the dot, dot, dot that Many people feel this doesn't represent. And in fact, if you do a little research and you hit Google, there's actually a more modern, more inclusive flag that is now being flown in many, many of the progressive areas of the LGBTQS community. Cynthia, I see you nodding. You want to add anything to that? Um, I was just going to say that uh, you're right. There's a, a much more modern um, LGBTQ flag. There's also the thought that, why are we showing you this one? Not to like give you the answer to the test, but you know, where is the transgender flag? Where is the flag of the country of Mexico? How come the FBI and the Department of Justice you know, will fly the pride flag in, uh, in June, when, uh, the month that usually celebrates gay pride, um, but they don't fly a certain other type of flag for a certain other holiday? You know, why is this one so particular? when it's just a teeny tiny percentage of the country. Um, so that's some of the, the, the blowback I think that I hear about the flag is, you know, why do you need to fly this in my face? I mean, seriously, like, why is everything rainbow? You know, I don't, I don't fly my, uh, you know, um, a flag that represents how I present to the world, to you, why do I have to look at a rainbow flag? Um, so sometimes it's, you know, for, for me, you know, I see the rainbow flag and I see safety. I'm a member of the community. I see safety. I see inclusion. I see um, uh, a welcoming um, environment or an atmosphere. So I see that and it's, you know, I, I, I feel good inside, but that's, but I realize that's not um, everyone's feelings when they see this. I'm also not sure if everyone's aware, but uh, in Italy, uh, this is considered the pace or, or peace flag. Um, and so it has a, a, a duplicate meaning in some environments, not just the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I, I would imagine, don't know if there are any folks in this call, um, but they certainly exist within our nation and around the world um, who have some religious beliefs that put them in the position of feeling very strongly that holding up and, and publicizing and supporting a community that is quote unquote sinful is not the role of government and, and should not be done. And we shouldn't be displaying this flag at all because it's destroying our children, it's destroying the family. Again, I'm, I'm just reflecting you know, a, a, another opinion that may be out there. Does that make them bad people or have they grown up with a perspective about an issue that is very different than mine? Um, and they view this image very differently than I do. Can I uh, jump in on that one, Brett? I think in society, we have a job to learn though. Like obviously I've seen this image transform from my life. Like, you know, I'm 31 now, whether it's my parents, grandparents, almost everyone I know has had a much, much more negative opinion of this image 20, 30, even 10 years ago than they do now. People want to evolve. It's one's job to continue learning and just think. As a Catholic myself, think if everything I think about God and 
and what I'm supposed to know. Would God really want us to discriminate and persecute people for something? Like, does this make any sense if someone does any critical thinking? So people need to continue learning, having conversations, meet people. People feel a type of way and feel my religion says I can persecute people for being, you know, gay or a lesbian, and then their kid has it. Surprise, surprise. Now they feel differently when their kid is it. Now they can see the light. Like, should it take one's own kid to have to be a member of this community for one to not want to, you know, persecute and see people in a negative light? That's just my take, though. Yeah, I, I will remind you and others, Zane, on the call that uh, unfortunately, particularly youth, um, are, are not always welcomed by their family and the homelessness rate, uh, rate and uh, rate of suicidal ideation, suicide, actual suicide within the LGBTQ plus community, particularly of youth, um, is is at epidemic proportions. And uh, it, it has to do with what you just talked about, Zane. There are many people who have not evolved from from those beliefs that, that, that they've either read or they've heard preached to them or been raised in their own households to believe. Yeah, but to add to that as well, Brett, I do want to say as an African-American male, uh, a lot of us are, you know, are allies. We're fighting in the same fight for LGBTQ rights, for, you know, a better Arlington, for, you know, immigration reform, for just policing for African-Americans. That being said, African-Americans are not as progressive as a lot of our neighboring, you know, white friends in New England. They just are not. They are not as far left on the LGBTQ issues and certain things as, you know, a lot of the ally white people are. So, coming out in the black community is an even bigger challenge. In the Caribbean community of black community, even bigger, bigger challenge. People really look at it. I have friends myself who still haven't come out to their parents. They're my age. They're like, yeah, they can never know. Like, you know, they still don't know what their own mom or dad are going to say if they're going to disown them. So some of that really is real. Like, Thanks for that comment, Zane. Any other any other stuff from uh, the group here? By the way, I, Jill, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you're keeping an eye here. We're moving right along. It's 25 after 8. I Can know. you believe that? <laughs> I saw. I was going to say, if we have, um, if anyone wants to comment on this one or chime in, certainly do so. so. Jill, I, I just want to recognize we're going back to the swastika here for a second because yeah. Joe Kiro, uh, uh, Joe, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, Joe Curo, um, made this comment about he separates the swastika itself from modern day Germany because um, he, he argues that modern German society has evolved quite a bit. I'm not sure everyone's aware. The display of the swastika in Germany is illegal. They don't permit it, right? It, 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 that is how, how strongly they feel that it has scarred their nation. It doesn't mean, by the way, there's a Holocaust Museum and those images are up there and they they definitely are teaching the history of the Holocaust in Germany. I've been there and it's amazing what they're doing. But but that point is well taken, Joe, that that here you have, right, a society that, you know, one of the deepest scars in, in our world's history, um, the Holocaust, emanated from that nation. And now that nation is looked upon as a nation that does welcome refugees and, and values diversity. In fact, you, know, you I just was in Berlin right before the uh, pandemic started. And you'd think you were in New York City. You'd think you were in any one of a, a number of American cities because of the diversity and, and just open environment that it is there. So really good point, Joe. Should we hit the next one? Let's do it. Here we go. All right. Oh. How do you see how they feel about this image. Here's the poll. Remember too, if you have specific questions or things you want to revisit, definitely put it in the Q and A box. Um, if we've got some time after going through the images, we can circle back to answer some of those questions. So the poll, you should see it. I don't 
I can't see what you see, <laughs> um, but it's a separate box that pops up that allows you to click on it. So if you're in the full screen mode, you might have to click around to see where it is, um, but it should be just a separate box that pops up that has a question and some different options. Yeah, it's so not got, it's not appearing on on my screen. I think that's what we're hearing from some some others. So the panelists won't see it. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, but everyone who's a, an attendee should. Okay. I'll give it one more second. Okay. Not the last two. Um. Hmm. Let's see. We might be able to move it. Does that help? Um, yeah, if you minimize your chat, you might be able to see it. Sorry. Okay, well, we've got. 27 out of 31 have filled it out. So most have seen it. So I'm going to end it and we'll just start to discuss. And if you weren't able to, you're more than welcome to chime in during the conversation um, to share your thoughts. So right now, it looks like a little bit of less positive. Feeling? Yep, it it absolutely leans <laughs> negative. Absolutely, Cynthia, you want to start on this, or or should I? Because um, I know we're both very pained by this. Um. So my first reaction when I see this, um, is, and this again, just as a reminder for maybe those who join late, um, I'm a retired special agent with the FBI, so I spent 22 years in law enforcement. Um, when I see this flag, I, I don't have an overwhelming positive reaction. Um, usually when I see this, I feel like it's, uh, a defensive posture that it is a, um, it's in response to another flag or another symbol. Um, we saw this a lot with, uh, in Ferguson, um, Saw it a lot uh, whenever there's a, um, a high profile incident of alleged police brutality. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, I, whenever I see this, and I know people wear this, um, I, I see a lot of former and present law enforcement wear this uh, bracelets or in jewelry or, or you know, t shirts and sweatshirts. I just always, um, I get a little nervous. Maybe I'll just put it, I'll leave it like that and I'll let Brett kind of uh, share his view with the other law enforcement person on the panel. Sure, so uh, I first raised my right hand in 1984 um, as a member of law enforcement. In my career, I try not to cry as I tell you all this, I have 18 coworkers whose names appear on the National Law Enforcement Memorial, which is in Washington, DC. And every officer that is killed in the line of duty is honored to have their name etched there in eternal remembrance. I am the president of an organization here in Washington, D.C. Well, there in Washington, D.C. because I'm in Cape Cod right now, um, called Concerns of Police Survivors, which seeks to remember and take care of the survivors of police officers killed in the line of duty. This thin blue line for me initially. That's what it meant. It meant that thin blue line that police officers must walk between good and evil, of safety and danger, of sacrifice and safety. And so it, it holds a very special place in my heart. But what it represents now to me is something that is very painful. My symbol's been stolen. The image that, that that I believe means something so honorable and so painful to me has been taken by other people and used as a symbol of hate, as a symbol of, of inequality. And that, that what about us ism that Cynthia 
um, revealed earlier. Uh, folks, if you, if you haven't watched closely, I want you to look back at the images from January the 6th. Michael Fanone, a police officer from the Metropolitan Police Department, I trained him and he worked for me during, his, during my career there, okay? He was nearly killed as an on-duty police officer responding to the insurrection. Waving above his head as they were trying to take his firearm off of him and people were saying, kill him with his own gun. That flag was waving above his head. Members of the insurrectionists, that crowd waved my symbol. And if I sound angry, if I sound sad, I am. Because if anybody understands how a symbol can change meaning, I get it. I don't wear the thin blue line anymore. It doesn't appear behind me on my wall when I, when I speak to community groups or to cops anymore. Because until I can reclaim that as a proud image, as an image that means the same thing to everybody, I, I'm not going to use it anymore. It's not because I'm not proud of it. It's not because I don't know what it means to be. Because I'm not going to hurt other people by using that image. I'll stop there, but we thought it was important to talk about this image because the last image we're going to talk about, I bet some of you have some very similar emotions about how that's been co-opted and how it's being used against your community and people that think and look the way you do. So I'll stop now. Let me see, are there any folks on um, the call who want to step up and share? Um, I know the chat is there, but if you're willing to say something, you're more hey, than to raise your hand. Hey, Cynthia, do you want to address um, Kathy's question there in the chat? I don't know if you can see it. She makes an assumption that anytime she sees this flag flying on someone's house, that they're a Trump supporter. That's a great question. Um, it's hard to know, right? So it, you see this flag and it's hard. You know, I, I have friends that fly, that fly the flag. I have friends that, that wear um, clothing and apparel that has the flag on it. Um, it's very common to see a thin blue line bracelet on a lot of police officers. Um, so it's really hard to know. You see this and you think, is that, you know, a, a colleague of mine or is that a Trump supporter? And like Brett said, you don't know. And it's super sad that this flag that um, was created as uh, as a, a symbol to honor law enforcement has been corrupted. And how do we reclaim that? Um, that's a that's a really really tricky situation. Um, I know that when Brett and I talk a lot about LGBTQ 101 issues, we talk about the word queer, and you know, to, to a lot of young LGBT folks. Um, they identify themselves as queer. They reclaimed that word that became a slur um, to their community. They reclaimed it and they proudly say that they are identifying as queer. Um, my hope is that this flag will once again be reclaimed as something positive and not something that is unclear. So I, I, I'm with you. I've seen the same thing. I've seen many, many houses that have a Trump flag and the thin blue line flag um, flying together. And it's very concerning because you just don't know. I see um, Grant has his hand up, so I'm gonna allow you to talk. While, um, while you do that, while, while you get Grant up there and speaking, I just want to address something Zane typed in the comments. Um, seeing this flag, the thin blue line flag, oftentimes surrounded by and next to the Confederate flag and make America great, and other Trump paraphernalia. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that is why many of us in law enforcement, I have to say, unfortunately, not the majority, <laughs> uh, but many of us in law enforcement now, I won't say have disassociated ourselves from the thin blue line because we still, we still in our hearts, those of us who know what its meaning was when it was created, believe in that meaning, but we are not going, to, I, I'm not going to hold up a symbol that people look at and think, well, does he also believe the Confederate flag and, and other hateful symbols are, are good too? I don't want to be confused that way. And so I, I'm confident enough that I can talk to people and explain to them what the thin blue line means. I don't have to display it. 
Um, go ahead. Why don't you like rant, make his comment or ask my, his question? Am I he hearing? Am I coming through? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a shame. I, I think the message of this flag is a bit co-opted. I mean, the, its use, the people who fly it, I don't think appreciate the nuance of police reform. I think so. Yeah, I, I and I, but I also don't see this flag very often in Arlington, um, fortunately. But what I do as a citizen who, who tries to, you know, tries to, how do we make the police better? Remember that in Arlington, we did have a huge banner across from the police station saying all cops are bastards. And I drove past that every day. And when it was talked about, it was not repudiated by many, it was cheered on by many. Um, so, you know, when you look at this flag, I say, yeah, no. But I, I do know there are people trying to say, how do we express support? I mean, Chicago just put a 30 year old woman into a box, a police officer killed on a traffic stop. So how do we express support for the police as a concept without this, which I think is being used to provoke, to cover for the worst of things? So it's it's troubling. But I, I, I if you want to talk about symbols in Arlington, this isn't what I see. I see all cops are bastards. And that troubled me just as deeply as seeing this flying. So I said my piece. Thank you. See, does anyone else have any feelings around some of the banners that Grant brought up? I, if I could just comment on just something what Grant said there. Yeah. Uh, Grant, I, I, I feel your frustration. Trust me, I, I raise it uh, more. Um, because I, I want very much to reclaim this symbol. Um, and I want very much to, I mean, my, Concerns of Police Survivors was amongst the first to respond to that young, young female officer's new mother, by the way, um, family, and will take care of her, uh, her family for the rest of their, their lives. Um, but we don't need a thin blue line to do that. I think the actions of people, um, our, our actions at the voting booth, our actions and where we put our money, our actions where we where we put our feet, right? On what side of an issue we stand, say a lot more than the flag that I fly on the front of my house. That's the easy thing to do, I think. You know, it, it's pretty easy to put a flag up and say, I support the police. But are, are you willing to go to a council hearing or select a hearing or whatever you call them in Arlington and to stand up and say, listen, you know, I... I I don't like what I'm seeing in law enforcement. I, I think there's far too much violence and excessive force and racial profiling. But that doesn't mean I don't support the police. I want better training. I want better cops. I want, I want the type of cops that reflect our values here in our community. I don't know that we need to fly a thin blue line flag to do that. Mm -hmm. To add to that, Brett, one of the most annoying things I see when I see this image pisses me off frankly is because it creates the divide that one is either anti-police or one supports the police when to be honest a lot of people that fly the flag are only using it to refute the black lives matter movement they don't actually give anything about the police they do not care like they only care when it's convenient for them and then the other way it twists it around that you can't want racial reforms and be pro-police at the same time like a lot of people such as myself have police officers in, in our family we, expect, uh, we respect the important work we do, believe police officers are an integral part of our community. It's not one of the extreme you know, views of we got to abolish the police. Like That's not the view I personally hold. That's not the view the NWSP holds. You know, we want to we wanna improve the work we do with our communities and policing as such. So the war and the rift that this creates between that, whether it says, okay, you're anti-police. These policies are anti-police. It's like, why do we have to be anti-police just for wanting you know, people who do bad things to be held accountable and wanting better policing. I'm reminded, Zane, that my parents in my upbringing punished me quite a bit. They criticized me quite a bit. It didn't change the fact that they supported and loved me. That, that those two things can exist. You can be critical of an entity. You can be critical of people. You can be critical of a profession, but still be supportive of them because you want better of them. You want them to grow. You want them to improve. You want to, to serve others better. And, and I think you, you, you put that very well. 
And I think I just want to read a comment um, that Melly shared, which I think is a great segue to our last image. Um, but what was shared was that the line is also on the American flag and that adds to the false equivalency of police and patriotism. patriotism. The flip side then implies that BLM or LGBTQ pride or support are therefore unpatriotic, which is not true. Um, and that co-signed by Alenza, um, you know, around misconceptions that often lead to false equivalences. So I think that will probably transition to the next. I image. wonder what it could be, Joe. What I could be possibly know. the grand <laughs> finale of images? I'm not sure. Let's see. <laughs> what? <laughs> so we'll launch the poll for this one and then um, we'll discuss. And then if there are things we want to revisit, we've got about 15 minutes left. So we'll try and get everything in while we can. And um, okay, let's see this one. And launch. Wait a few more seconds. Okay. Um, let's see. We have about 80% of the participants voted, and we will call it now. So we're going to share these results. So we've got about 50%, uh, a little over 50% of folks feeling somewhat positive about this, um, about 32%, a little bit positive, some neutral, and about two folks that don't feel so great about this. So does anyone on our panel want to kick it off with their perspective? I'll start with that, Jim. So blue, uh, Black Lives Matter has uh, meant a lot of different things to many people. It's shifted uh, to, you know, less extreme to more, you know, global. But that being said, like even myself, I have multiple opinions of Black Lives Matter. It conjures up different things to how I think. NAACP is a different organization than Black Lives Matter. So some things we're aligned with, some things, you know, don't want to fully run and fully endorse. So to some Seeing the symbol sometimes it symbolizes someone being an ally, supporting, you know, better policing in America, a more just society for African Americans. And then other times I see just, I guess, just a badge of like laziness sometimes. Like, let me put a black square on my Instagram or Facebook. Let me just say Black Lives Matter. I'm not really willing to do the work. I'm not going to go to any meetings that Brett said. I'm not going to vote. I'm not, I'm just, but I'm just going to say Black Lives Matter so people get off my case because it's the popular thing to do. My favorite celebrities are saying Black Lives Matter. Let me just, you know, display the symbol in this thing. So this is a great example of how symbols can mean different things. Then sometimes other groups assume Black Lives Matter is extremist, that they're going to be some of the people that were at some of the pe peaceful protests that some of them turned a little, you know, at night, a little toward a way of looting and violence. So some people just categorize and put you in that box. So Black Lives Matter can mean many different things, but overall, I generally think it means people are doing the right thing and want to be an ally. I, I, I'd like to share a perspective that has been shared with me. I, again, I will I will place the the disclaimer on this that it's not necessarily my opinion, but but I think it's one that needs to be heard. There are some that view Black Lives Matter as an effort to to make sure that the African American community gets more than other communities. That somehow, I will personalize this, that I as a Caucasian man, as a white American, have to give something up in order for black lives to matter. 
And now very much personalizing this, that's where I think this has been co-opted. Because from the very beginning, what I've heard the message to be is, hey, what about us? Black Lives Matter too. Black Lives Matter also. We need to recognize, we as a society, that there are so many places, the criminal justice system is one of them, but many places where there is racial inequality and that until we, one, acknowledge it, and two, actually put systematic changes in place to improve upon it, that racial equality will never, ever change. Um, and, and it doesn't just exist between black and white. It's within our own communities that this happens. Um, and, and that's what's so frustrating to watch this, that, that there's this tit for tat, that a Black Lives Matter flag goes up on someone's home and that their neighbor across the street needs to put up a flag of the Confederacy or to say, all lives matter. I, it, it's completely distorting the message that it was originally meant to, to, to bring to light. And then when you add those people who have walked, right, surrounding that image, and some of them put masks over their faces and call themselves anarchists and start looting and destroying property, who, who really don't represent the Black Lives Matter movement, they bring shame and they bring an image into a completely different light. I go back to the thin blue line. It, it, to me, it's exactly what's happened to the thin blue line. To many is what's happened to the Black Lives Matter motto and, and flag. And movement. I'm just looking in the chat. Um, and I'm wondering if any folks who are voicing their opinions are interested in saying a bit more. Um, I saw the comment about believing that any symbol dividing us by race is not helping the conversation. Um, I think that that's, and that's an interesting perspective. And I, I personally didn't see Black Lives Matter as that way. And I guess I'll just share my perspective. So I am mixed, I'm half white, I'm half black. And having this type of discussion with both sides of my family is really interesting. Um, because I have folks on both sides who feel both ways that you need to talk about the fact that Black lives haven't mattered and now's the time that they need to be accounted for, but also that idea of, well, all lives matter. We all just need to work together to make it better and value humanity, but it's acknowledging that not everyone has been considered considered a part of humanity. And I think for me, it's been, it's been a journey to be able to have these conversations daily because often people don't know what my background is. They don't know, you know, I'm in this role, I'm spearheading diversity, equity, and inclusion, but little do you know that I've also had very racist Italian grandparents who did not want my mother to marry my father. You know, it's, that's embedded in my family and having these conversations still daily is always happening. Um, but specifically for Black Lives Matter, for me, it's, it's a statement of that the time is now that those lives need to matter and they need to continue to matter and still there until they're seen on the same playing field as all lives. And I'm just, anyone else can chime in. <laughs> if anyone wants to speak up, certainly raise your hand um, and we can look to the chat for some other comments. I see Lynette has raised her hand. We can let you talk. And then if anyone else would like to, certainly feel free to raise your hand, okay? Yeah, this, this, um, this symbol, this message, this movement to me um, represents empowerment. Um, and um, as a woman, not a woman of color, a white woman, um, I've known I've known um, oppression, um, and 
um, whenever, and I know our history and I know what has happened, you know, because I have that knowledge, um, I know that something has to change for black people, for people of color in, in this country. And, um, and, and this, and, and it feels like this is like, I wanna be behind this, this voice that's speaking up and saying, yes, we matter too. We're important too. We're human too. And, um, and that, you know, that's, that to me is um, exciting um, and empowering and, um, gives me gives me hope it's encouraging i enjoy I, yeah that's it <laughs> hey joe i think it's important before we i know we only have five minutes here before we close to acknowledge some of some of the comments here have have very clearly said they find this image this flag to be divisive um mm -hmm. and 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 i think as as i read these comments they they feel that it's been politicized that that it means more than just um equality now but it's choosing sides of a political debate um that people are taking and that some people are simply using it to express their political views as opposed to a human rights or civil rights uh, position and i think that 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 goes back to how we started this conversation. You know, what something means to you can mean something different to me. And it's based off of our experiences, our identities, and whether you see it as a political sign or a cultural sign, it's about having these types of discussions to kind of get it out there so we can start to come to an understanding of what it is we are trying to share and talk about. And, and I, I kind of just want to ask the group this question. Um, it, it's sort of similar to what I asked you earlier, Jill, about if you saw that, that personal vehicle parked in the police station's parking lot with the Confederate flag on the bumper, just your visceral reaction to seeing a car parked um, in your neighborhood that has the thin blue line sticker on the bumper or on, on the windshield, or that has Black Lives Matter um, somehow displayed on it or any one of your neighbors who put one of those images up in their window or hanging from their, their doorway, you know, do we assume what that person is saying simply because of the implicit bias we have towards that image? Or do we actually take the time to listen to that person and to hear what it is, is behind their display of that image? Um, because I know just from the police background, you know, not everyone with the thin blue line sticker supports a particular political party. They may have a friend on that National Law Enforcement Memorial Wall and it means something very specific to them to put that there. On the other hand, uh, as a member of the LGBTQ plus community myself, um, I know my mother and father have stickers on their bumpers that are gay pride. Um, by the way, they have the old ones. I'm trying to update it with the new ones, but I, hey, they're 78. I can't change them overnight. but. <laughs> Do people assume that my parents are gay and lesbian because they have those stickers on their bumper? Um, my dad revels in that, by the way. My mother's not so sure how comfortable she is with that. So, Yeah, I think it's very real. I think we see these things and we make our own assumptions, but it's all about asking those questions. I've certainly done it in my own neighborhood. There are plenty of BLM signs in yards and when I do go out for my runs, I'm quite curious who lives there. So sometimes if folks are in their yard, I'll just stop and talk. <laughs> hey, Jill, we also have this comment from Christiana, who uh, thank you very much for uh, for your comment, Christiana here. She, she outs herself as a police officer um, and it looks like as a black police officer here and, and asked about black police officers' lives. And, and where do they fit into this Black Lives Matter movement that some of which, we shouldn't say the majority, but some of which have some very strong feelings against the police or, or may even be for, as Zane alluded to, very few of them think abolishing the police or defunding the police is, is the right answer here. I mean, that, that's a huge discussion because, you know, law enforcement is represented by a diverse group of people, not the majority of people, okay? It's still very a white, 
male-dominated profession, and, and anybody that denies that is just not looking at the facts. But, I mean, I'm a gay Jew that can ice skate, and I had to protect the Ku Klux Klan when they marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. If you don't think that wasn't something I didn't want to do, then you don't know me very well. And the assumptions that are made about me, right, because of how I look and the profession I'm in. So I, I, I get it totally, Christiana, and thank you for your service. You're going to have to bring it to an end here soon, Jill. I'll turn it over to you. I know. I would say I wish we had another hour. Um, I think we can unshare the screen and we can kind of all be here. Um, this has been really wonderful. I'm so glad we were able to test out this new form of engagement with participants. Um, I know it's been tough to be able to um, try and have these conversations over Zoom and do it in a way that's sensitive, but I feel like for this time, for, for this conversation, this went well, and hopefully moving forward, we'll start to use this a little differently. Um, but I just want to say thank you again, Cynthia, Brett, Zane, for joining us and everyone who participated. Um, similar to last year, we've been partnering with True Story Theater and paralleling these talks. Um, so next week, I think maybe Chris will put it in the chat or I can. Um, they'll be having a, an active bystander training. Um, so it'll be part of the Community Conversation Parallel Series. So that'll be August 17th also over Zoom um, next Tuesday from 7 to 8.30. So that training will explore how to safely and effectively intervene um, when we witness situations of bigotry or injustice. And I think also part of that, if folks are leaving this conversation, that you can take what you learned here today and just start to have conversations, ask questions, see, don't make assumptions, um, be open to listening to different perspectives and I think that's one step we can all take to start to make some of the changes we want to see. So I think there, I'll probably wrap it up because <laughs> we're now we're a minute over, but this was really wonderful. Thank you again, everyone. And um, if you have questions or comments or anything, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thanks. Thanks for hosting this, Jill. And thank you to everybody for participating. Zane and Cynthia, thanks. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, all.